Back in 1970s, astronomers who were studying various stars, including of course our sun, realized that as the stars produce a lot of solar wind, this wind physically interacts with the magnetic field from the star to create the effect known as magnetic braking. A really intriguing physical effect that slows down the rotation of the star over time. In other words, the magnetic field from the star itself grabs onto the solar wind and starts to slowly slow down the rotation of the object. And a few years later, Andrew Skamanich was able to discover a really interesting relationship between stars' rotation and their age. Here, by looking at the very famous Hyades Open Cluster, the cluster you see right there, on this map created by Kevin Jardine from galaxymap.org, he was essentially able to uncover that the average rotation velocity of all stars in the cluster were sort of inversely proportional to the square root of the cluster's age. Or, just to rephrase this, there was a direct relationship between the age of the cluster and how fast the stars were spinning. Which of course implied one thing. We could maybe theoretically use the rotation of stars to determine their age. And in 2003, Sidney Barnes was able to develop a lot of formula that are now used today to calculate the age of these stars based on how fast they spin. And later on this concept became an official method for measuring stars' age. It's now known as gyrochronology and it's become a really popular method to measure the age of various stars. Although it doesn't work for much larger and more massive stars and seems to only apply to low mass main sequence stars with a spectral class of F or lower, which technically includes our Sun. And that's mostly because for stars much larger than the Sun, there are a lot of other effects, including really powerful emissions from the surface of the star. And so there, just one technique no longer works. But in order to establish the exact relationship and to figure out the formula, astronomers essentially used various clusters. And here, by knowing the age of the cluster and by then looking at average rotation of various stars, and comparing it to their mass as well, it becomes possible to work out exactly how this gyrochronology works. Although for the most part, this has only been used with younger clusters, and so here we're talking about open clusters, such as once again, Hyades. Interestingly enough, our Sun is one of the data points, with the age of 4.5 billion years old and a rotation period of 25 days. And for many years now, actually more like a couple of decades, astronomers expected this relationship to hold no matter what. As long as the star was kind of similar to our sun, maybe a little bit bigger, or even dramatically smaller, this relationship should hold. By measuring the rotation, we should be able to estimate the age with only about 10% error. This definitely worked for these cluster stars, and so it should technically work for other stars as well. But something started happening a few years back. It actually started with the data from the Kepler telescope, where another scientist, Jennifer Van Satters, discovered 21 separate stars whose rotations did not really match the pattern. Basically, the rotation of the stars was still slowing, but once they reached a certain age, and actually very close to our sun, for some reason the rotations stopped slowing down. You can learn more about this in a study from 2016, but in a nutshell, this was the first sign that maybe this pattern doesn't always work. There's something else going on here. And in the last few years, more and more data started to come out with more and more proof that for some reason, once the stars get old enough, this relationship doesn't seem to work anymore. And specifically, once the stars reach approximately halfway through their lifetime, they seem to not slow down the rotation much anymore and just keep spinning with the same rotation speed. And though at first they weren't really sure what's going on here, everything here was once again pointing at the magnetic field. It looks like once the star starts to spin with a certain rotation speed, its magnetic field is just not strong enough anymore to influence anything. And so without having powerful magnetic fields, it's left with very weak stellar wind and just keeps spinning and spinning and spinning. With a lot of this recently confirmed by studying a very famous star, 51 Pegasi, a really interesting sun-like star that's very similar to our sun in almost everything except that it's a little bit more massive and a little bit brighter, that's also one of the first stars where we actually discovered a planet. You can see the planet orbiting right there. Very, very close to the star, but still this was one of the first ever found. And what's interesting about the star is that it's just a little bit older than the Sun. It's about 6.1 billion years old, based on a lot of other calculations, which in essence implies that this particular star is already more than halfway through its main sequence period. And because this is a much more evolved star than our Sun, the scientists were always kind of intrigued by this star in order to discover what's actually going on here. 
and apparently the star does hide quite a lot of mysteries. First of all, by studying its rotation, the scientists behind this recent study established that gyrochronology seems to not work here at all. And more importantly, the magnetic field here is at least 10 times weaker than originally predicted. Yet despite the weak magnetic field, the rotation is sort of faster than it should be and is actually surprisingly close to our Sun. Our Sun takes approximately 25 days to spin once, this star takes approximately 22 days. In essence, implying that the magnetic braking does not seem to work here anymore, and this star has an extremely weak magnetic field. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest mysteries about the star from the last few decades is the fact that it doesn't seem to contain a lot of sunspots from all of the previous observations. This star is close enough to physically see sunspots, or I guess star spots, and none were detected so far. As a result of this, it was actually proposed that the star in this case is in some kind of a Maunder minimum, or basically in the low magnetic period of the star, but in reality this may go much further. It might be a much longer period, a result of something else happening inside the star that the scientists are trying to understand. And so since gyrochronology does not work for these stars, it means that something happens to most of these stars to suddenly prevent magnetic braking from slowing them down at some point in their lifetime, and it most likely happens to all of the stars that reach certain age. But the reason all of this is super important is because of our Sun. It looks like our Sun may be at that limit. The Sun seems to be approaching the period where magnetic braking is no longer going to be effective, with the magnetic field of the Sun weakening as a result, which would technically explain why our Sun had so many different magnetic anomalies in the last thousand years or so. It might be going through some major changes on the inside, which might last for thousands or even millions of years, but will eventually make the Sun much weaker magnetically, resulting in a lot of magnetic quiescence, and basically the Sun that's just extremely mild. We don't really know how this is going to affect planet Earth, but chances are it's going to affect it in a positive way. More importantly, because we know this happens to a lot of stars similar to our Sun, and even very likely smaller stars such as very active M-type stars, it implies that with time, a lot of different stars out there, even though they might be very active at first, will become quiet enough to potentially support life, or potentially create necessary conditions on various planets to stabilize the environment long enough for life to form. And that is a pretty big discovery. It actually means that much older stars have a very high chance to create long-term conditions for habitability. A pretty big discovery, assuming it's correct. And since we know that in more active systems, such as for example the nearby Proxima Centauri, stellar outbursts can basically strip the planet of any signs of atmosphere and liquid water on the surface, the implication from this study is that if you wait long enough, most extremely common stars in the galaxy might become hospitable to life after a certain time. But for most of these stars, it might be still too early. For example, for a lot of M-type stars, they're still pretty active and they're still spinning pretty fast. And so it may take some time for all of them to stabilize the environment and to stop producing so many powerful emissions. And so for all we know, maybe this is also one of those answers to the Fermi paradox. Maybe we are just one of the first types of life anywhere, and other stars are just not ready yet to sustain habitable conditions. We'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos, but for now this is a pretty exciting discovery that sort of rewrites books on the famous gyrochronology technique. Once there are more discoveries, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.